Welcome back to the Pilgrim Faith Podcast, where human wonder fuels the quest for Christian wisdom. I'm joined once again today by uh, my good friend Ryan Hurd, but absent my typical partner, Dale Stenberg. He's not feeling well today, so it's just going to be a uh, conversation between Ryan and I, continuing our our, our fun discussion about uh, saying God last week, and uh, we hope, Lord willing, to continue this conversation on into into next week, just before just before Christmas. Um, uh, maybe as a way of beginning, Ryan, just to pick up. I know we want to make some intellectual movement today and work through a couple of things, but maybe to pick up uh, a couple of points from last time. One of the things you said last time that I thought was very interesting, and I think maybe some listeners would want to hear more, uh, is I think you were describing uh, uh, s- s- sort of a, a medieval saints, and in this case, St. Thomas's sort of knowledge of God, sort of ascending the Mount Sinai, if you will. Uh, uh, and you made the claim that, that the highest knowledge of God is the knowledge that God is not. Uh, and I, I suspect that for some people, that would be uh, not obviously false, but al- also somewhat counterintuitive. And I wonder if I wonder if that claim can be uh, 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 brought down a, a layer, uh, a layer down the mountain for other people to understand what's what's being claimed there. Yeah, that's a really great question. It's also a very very difficult question, uh, and has a, a lot of extremely technical moments about it. Uh, whenever you read in the tradition, this is really the the tradition's answer. It's not just St. Thomas. Uh, everyone who's anyone in theology. Uh, has always held this position. Um, they always describe it in these very ecstatic experiences. And, and most people, when they read the dramatic account of, of, of monks uh, transcending and having these flashes of, of uh, God dawning upon them and, and entering the cloud of unknowing and bearing upon the darkness and silence that ensues. Uh, when you read those types of descriptions, most people get very, very uncomfortable. And there's good reason for that. It is a very uncomfortable experience. It's often described in terms, if you read mystics, of the dark night of the soul, especially the final dark night of the soul, where you have fully unhooked from creature land and you are verging upon God. So you're in between the created realm and and God himself, so to speak, which is obviously not a place that you can be. We're speaking highly metaphorically here. But nonetheless, it's a very intense experience even though it's an intense experience that's described in innumerable ways and in very dramatic ways and very colorful and poetic ways by the tradition, especially its mystics, nonetheless, it's an extremely precise event that happens in the intellect when that you perform upon yourself or have performed upon yourself when you encounter reality. It just takes a really long time of reflection upon it in a a many many and long line of uh, negative judgments to ensue to eventually get to that point. And basically what happens is you begin by saying that God is, and what you're predicating there of God is ipsum essay itself or being itself just as it is with us and among creatures. So you, uh, for instance, when you're demonstrating that God is, or rather you're demonstrating that the judgment that it is, is true when predicated of God necessarily as the final or or first cause of all. Uh, When you say God is, which is the conclusion again of of any demonstration of the existence of God, so to speak, as people speak of it today, we don't actually demonstrate the existence of God, but rather we demonstrate that our judgment that it is, is true. Right. That's another story. When you make that judgment, uh, Aristotle talks about and St. Thomas talks about commenting on Boethius, the fact that you can basically either go up from there to the highest knowledge of God, which is that next negative judgment immediately after you've demonstrated the existence of God, or you can revert and go back down the mountain. And when you revert and go back down the mountain, this is the point where philosophy is born. It begins in wonder and this flash of being, which, which is enacted upon the mind. And the mind is startled, Boethius says, and Thomas says, is this massive flash, again, where philosophy is born out of this wonderment of, of, of the asking of why. And, and you begin to revert down the mountain and you begin to predicate all of the positive aspects of ipsum esse or being itself of God, which necessarily belong, belong to this one whom you've said to be by virtue of being ipsum esse subsistent as, as, the, as, the, as that behind which none else can be and things, things of that sort. 
So you can go down the mountain and that's where we do systematics underneath the final negative judgment and immediately below that, this affirmative judgment that God is. And then you have the affirmation of all the attributes of God, which is what people would call today attributes of God. These are the names designating simple perfections, which we talked about last time, goodness, wisdom, and others of that sort. And if you look at, for instance, the uh, schematization of Thomas assumed, you'll see that pattern played out. Thomas is trying to follow this type right. of order when he posits that God is, then he inserts simplicity because that's the moment that simplicity happens in the intellect. And then you continue to waddle back down the mountain. But the point is that you're always immediately reverting to this place. So you're going down the mountain and, and springing back up. And that's how all of these other things, these other moments on the mountain, mm -hmm. as it were, are actually true because you're starting and returning to that place in a circular motion. Anyway, when you say God is, then immediately you have to recognize that the being that you have just said God to be is not the being whereby God is what he is. This is where we begin to say God is not. There's lots of ways of talking about this. There's lots of judgments that are associated with, and they're very closely associated together. It's very difficult for the mind to uh, stand at this moment. The, the tradition talks about uh, standing in this ceaseless act of removal, where you're just circulate, you're, you're just cir circling, as it were, and hovering in the darkness, wherein God is said to dwell, as John of Damascus says. When you say God is not, what you're literally saying is God does not exist. A lot of people like to say that today to be very provocative. I hope people understand immediately that when we say that, that's a very mm. different type of statement than almost everybody means. You don't have to be afraid. <laughs> God does exist. It's okay. A lot of people in the Greek tradition like to do this. John Milbank likes to have his little Twitter one-offs every once in a while where he says, FYI, God doesn't exist and things like that. That's just silly. That is what's being said, but it's so technical. Just don't say that out loud because people will be confused. What we're saying is that this Ipsum essay here, this being here that we have just said God to be, not the very actual judgment that it is that we've said God to be, but rather that name or that, that ipsum esse in creatures, which is that from which our name of being has been taken. So basically the fact that creature, the, the creaturely mode of being itself, which is non-subsistent is not at all what God is because that's an imperfect way of having being. And every aspect of imperfection is to be removed from God. Not only if we are talking about, for instance, the mixed perfections, but even the modes of having something which can be more or less perfect in the created order. Mm. So when you recognize that every creature not only shares in being, but also mm. shares in being non-subsistently, that is to say dependently or accidentally and all sorts mm. of different ways that we can talk about this, that very aspect of having ipsum esse or being itself is not proper to God in any way. Rather, it is a creaturely feature which is being removed at that moment where we're saying God is not. We're saying this being itself here, God is not that. Thomas talks about this very uh, aggressively, especially in I sent D8, which is a really beautiful passage where he talks about the various uh, modes of removal, the levels of removal. We start out here below and we remove the corporeal perfections of God insofar as they have some aspect of potency. Then we move up and we remove the uh, simple perfections from God insofar as they have an imperfect mode proper to them, which is belonging to creatures. And then we move up to ipsum esse and we do something similar there as well. So all this is going mm. on. When you say this negative judgment, there's actually one more judgment that you can make, which St. Thomas makes, and he probably, it's, it's difficult, it's very, very difficult to tell, but it's quite possible he's making it as a genuine advance upon someone like a Dionysius. So Dionysius very, very famously has, has the three things that you say anytime you have some aspect of a simple perfection or ipsum esse itself, which is going to be similar to a simple perfection, insofar as both have the aspect of act. For instance, I say, God is love. God is not love. Not God is not love because God lacks love, but because God is super love. Right. Super there. 
So this is very familiar to people. You're doing a similar type of thing when we're, when we're doing ipsamase. God is, God is not, God is beyond being, right? That's Dionysius. This judgment here is actually, this third judgment is actually lower than this one for various reasons we don't want to get into because they're too technical. But Thomas recognizes that because ipsa messe is, 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 is scattered as it were throughout all of creatures, not only with respect to their accidents, but even the very modes of having their accidents. Mm. Therefore, uh, when you say that God is being himself uh, and, 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 and there's no real distinction between essay and essentia and things like that, uh, he recognizes that you can take the aspect of the most perfect way of having something, which is having it subsistently. Mm -hmm. And you can adjoin that conception to ipsamese. You can mm -hmm. unite and basically make this judgment where you predicate ipsamese subsistent or subsistent being itself of God. It's actually a lower judgment content-wise, predicate-wise, the, the the formality that's being predicated there is a mixture of lower things in this negative judgment. It's highest God is not. And when you do that, then you can gain some understanding of what God is underneath the negation. So it's always already analogical. God is, God is not. Not is not because of lack, but because of fullness. God is beyond being. God is subsistent being. And this is a mode of having being which is analogically taken up from substance and accidents, not substance insofar as it substands under accidents, of course, but insofar as it subsists. Um, it's a mode of having, which is taken up as an analogical tool for squeezing out some understanding of God. Mm. Is there a, yeah. oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, uh, no. Uh, 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 I wonder if, um, the, uh, this is a somewhat random question, but you know, a, lo a large part of what we try to do in the in, in the podcast is sort of blend discourses. And one of the things I wonder, you, you you use this pretty classic metaphor of the ascent up the mountain and the the descent down the mountain, which of course is is uh, a, a, in in ancient Near Eastern and Second Temple thought very well very much had to do with the temple there's sort of these gradations of, as you well know, there's these sort of gradations of holiness in the temple, the core of the temple associated with light and whatever. Is there a, um, is there a, uh, a, a thick tradition of associating as far as you're aware, and maybe not uh, stages as it were stages of temple purity uh, with the metaphysics of act that there's sort yeah. of like, uh, 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 you know, the outer courts, this level of act, you know, the inner courts, this level of act, the holy of holies, you know, pure act, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that would be the spiritual sense of the temple. And similarly, the spiritual sense of the mountain of Sinai. So the fathers and high medievals believe that not only do the words of scripture themselves uh, contain uh revelation so to speak is not really a good way of putting it as i as i just have but irregardless um but even the realities themselves about which the words are speaking also sometimes not all the time but sometimes have been specially sanctified by god as a symbol uh someone who perhaps in the last century has done the most work on this of course would be carl rahner this idea of real symbol or uh this this thick or saturated phenomenon, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways of talking about this today. Um, in biblical studies, you know, no one talks about the spiritual sense in any, in, in any regard today, no one knows what the spiritual sense is, but that's an, again, another story. But yes, uh, the tradition believes that God made the mountain of Sinai to be a sign. Therefore, the words of Holy Scripture, which are signifying the mountain of Sinai, are also signifying something that itself signifies, and it signifies this journey of the mind into God. And so the fathers very frequently pick up this real symbol or this re, this race significance, this significant reality or signing thing that God has made to be a sign uh, as a uh, as a, as a means for, for uh, signifying the very journey of the intellect into God, which is what they 
believe it was intended to signify by God is this movement up to God. And the various aspects of, you know, Gregory of Nyssa is very famous for this, perhaps from the Greek fathers, of course, is like, is like with Moses, you're ascending the mountain, you have people below, and everyone, everyone does this. You have to, uh, various aspects of the journey uh, are matched up with various moments of the mind. And again, as we mentioned last time, and this is so, so essential, none of these moments are random or happenstantial or unhooked mm. by reality as such. Mm. They are firmly controlled and governed and normed by creaturely reality in as much as it is such. So the very real similitude and the very real dissimilitude or difference, both of which are wrapped simultaneously, Thomas says, in every creature. In every creature, there is a real similitude and dissimilitude to God. And those right. are not like separate little aspects of its reality, but they're wrapped together in a certain way that only the mind can unpack, which is where we talk about being an ever greater dissimilitude in every similitude, latter and full. Um, and when you unpack that creaturely reality, you have to respond to that with your mind. And that basically becomes the proper object of the minds, so to speak, the proper object of the mind's own workings. And so, for instance, even when I get up so unbelievably abstract, like I've made hundreds of negations or just some un unbelievably large amount of negations to get, the, to get to this is not statement at the end, at the top of the mountain of Sinai, where I finally have unhooked from creation, something that very, very few people are actually capable of doing. Because when you do it, you're not just saying, is not like randomly with your words or with your mind or with your right. thought, you are concluding to that. So one, one area I think a lot of people get confused about is when we talk about the movement ascent of Mount Sinai in, in, as a metaphor, mm. these are conclusions. So we're going down the page as it were, conclusion one, conclusion two, and these are steps up the mountain. So you just have to keep those types of things in mind and every conclusion requires you to be self-possessed and see the thing that is motivating you in the, in the technical sense of a movement, motivating you to, to sweep down to the next stage, right? And it's and not a, get... it's not just the capability then once you say that of a, it's not just even then the capability of getting to a conclusion, but the actual possession of the habit it of is, that conclusion. Yeah, it is the conscious self-possession of every motive for concluding okay. and allowing the intellect to sweep. Because when the when, when the intellect concludes, so it's not a lot of work. It's already there. The muscles there. The muscles there, but but when you make the non-est conclusion at the bottom, you have to enact the entire journey at once in a flash. Right. And you have to have a certain amount of intellectual zip in order to to uh, all of a sudden go zoom all the way up the mountain. And right. that's what the intellect is doing. And that's what you, that's what you train to do, by the way, at every moment of the journey, which is why, for instance, slotting them up, chopping them up rather into individual isolated moments of negation allows you to practice and become strong at that movement so that then you can sync it all up, synthesize with this dazzling insight to where you're vaulted. It's almost, again, I think I used the, the metaphor of like a rocket last time. I also like to think of it as like, a race car driver, or what was the uh, the crazy motorcycle dude that used to evil Knievel or something? Like yes, that? yes. Crazy ramp. Like what 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 you're trying to do is 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 back up, get a get a get a big runway in front of you, and all of a sudden just gun it and floor it and zoom, and then you launch and you're in midair, and then you just stop, and you have a ceaseless rotation, and that's where the greatest theologians that have ever lived, have lived and abided and then spoken out of. Right. So they're standing there or they're floating there as it were. And this is where, you know, depending on your, your personal views on these types of things, you do read accounts of actual floating and levitation. Yeah. This type of thing, which yeah Aquinas are, floated, didn't he? Isn't there a tale of him floating? There, there is. Yeah. I, I'm not really, I'm not really quite sure about that. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I certainly believe that, that uh, plenty of people have floated and, and can float, but uh, I, I know at least I've yeah. not been able to so far.
anyway, <laughs> that's just a little. That's bit. a different subject. Floating different saints, subject. yeah, yeah. Le levitation and bilocation and all, all the crazy things that uh, <laughs> you never knew you could do. Yes, that's right. Um, very, very briefly, maybe one before we kind of uh, you know move from where the conversation's been at. Um, uh, you know, for some people, when we think about this gradation of this kind of gradation of temple holiness or this gradation of act almost, I wonder if for some people there's a violation of kind of the creature creator boundary. Uh, uh, it, well, not a violation, but it's unclear. L Lewis actually says this. It's very interesting that the modern imagination can almost kind of think of God in creation. That's a move that that some people can sort of perform, but we have an especially hard time with angels. That feels particularly weird to us. And I wonder if it would be helpful just very briefly to say what's going on in the in the way in which, uh, what's going on in the in-between stage, if you could put it that way. Why is, you, you know, this kind of movement toward this cloud of unknowing, when we talk about, and you even, we had to strain language for a second there, uh, you, you're almost the closest you can get to God, and yet you're always, you know, the brain goes, but we're always a creature, right? We're always infinitely removed from God, no matter what mode of existence we have. And so what's going on in the, this stretch of a creaturely mode of being, where it is, it seems to be, nevertheless, we can, from down here, we can speak of that as godlike as heavenly speak of whatever that 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 movement up the mountain is as a movement toward god even though presumably creatures always possess a always possess a creaturely mode of existence i i mean yes and no uh i, I think i probably would want to capitalize on the no uh to what you're saying for the moment it, there is a very strong yes aspect to it of course as well but the this is where a lot of people get confused and the the, the main uh, the main point of confusion in the last hundred years or so well this is this has actually been a it's been both in the Dedeo Uno where we talk about the essence and attributes of God but also in the in the Dedeo Trino when we talk about the difference between the imminent and the economic Trinity and this is where everyone gets really anxious and things like that the entire rest of the tradition doesn't speak like that and knows that that's that's incredibly errant to 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 treat theology like that and in yeah, and, and firmly rejects these types of ideas. Basically, what happens is you're 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 doing God in Himself by default, by virtue of having removed every creature. Therefore, whatever remains, nothing remains. But whatever remains uh, is is therefore knowledge of God. And when you're moving, uh, when you're reflecting back down the mountain again from this place of having removed from all creatures, therefore, again, by default, you're actually doing theology itself, not just God for us, but God in himself. It's again talking about essence and attributes of God, but a similar type of thing happens when we do Trinity. And you just have to remember that there is always a negative judgment above your mental space when you're, when you're lower down, that you're snapping back to and you must continually snap back to in order to verify every one of these affirmative judgments. That's why we say all of these are analogical. They are genuinely what God is, but they're also genuinely not what God is. And in mm. fact, so much are they not what God is that we don't know anything what God is. We only know what God is not. And that sounds all contradictory. And of course, on the surface, as you listen to my words, everything I just said was inherently contradictory. It's actually not when you start to pick it apart and understand the precise judgments that are being made. It just sounds contradictory and it's very difficult to keep straight for people. You just have to remember, again, you make it up to that final judgment of negation. And this is also the place from which we do the doctrine of the Trinity. It doesn't matter the fact that we're given supernatural revelation. It doesn't change our position. It doesn't change our behavior. It doesn't change our attitude. What does change, so to speak, is the fact that we do have faith. We do have more potent light or more forceful light and, and other aspects of like certainty and more information, if you want to put it in those types of terms, which, which become very quickly unhelpful. So there are obviously positive advancements to supernatural revelation, not to mention supernatural faith. But nonetheless, you're still 
creature, still dealing in creaturely terms with God and still starting from creature land. So God is all the way condescended down to the dust, as it were, and given us creatures to look at and then to launch back in. So when we do the doctrine of the Trinity, it's not like all of a sudden magically we're finally doing what God is, whereas before we weren't in natural theology because we didn't know. No, they're both things that we zip back up towards to do the negative judgment that God is not this that has been said. Uh, yeah, so you just have to, to understand those types of things. Um, but just noting the fact that we only are doing God in himself by default, so to speak. Having removed ourselves, we speak with Dionysius and Thomas Aquinas' comments on Dionysius' divine names. The intellect consciously divests itself of all creatures and then even divesting itself of itself. And therefore, what remains must be God himself. That's the type of move that's happening. And you're just acting out theology from that place of self-divestation and creatures' divestation. So you have to weigh your positive judgments accordingly, recognizing that you've already voided what you're saying, hmm. but not voided. This is, this is very important because people hear that and they think that the very same thing that I affirm is the very same thing that I negate, right? And so, not, so negative theology and, and positive theology appear to be at competes, or at least strained upon each other or, mm. or pressed upon each other or norming each other. No, there, it's like a zipper. There's various aspects of a zipper and you, you negative, it's kind of like that. Um, that's important to note because what you're negating is the potency, not the act. Right. So every time you make a judgment of negation, you're moved to make that judgment of negation because God is pure act. And every time you're moved to make the affirmation, you're moved to make the affirmation because God is pure act and things like that. And so both the negative movements of removal and both the affirmative movements are resting on the same thing in God as it were, in his being. Um, but they're also not, the proper object of each judgment affirmed and denied are not the same and mm. their reasons underlying are not the same. And that's very important. Otherwise it just feels like you're writing on the whiteboard and then erasing it quick, or maybe erasing the whiteboard, the whiteboard first and then writing on it. And, and, and people feel like, well, this is a really weird thing to do. And how can you actually make positive progress? It's like, no, that's not what's going on in the mind. And it's not the actual gains you make on God. You're not voiding out the very thing. You're not whiting it out exactly what you're saying. It's, it's more complicated. Yeah. That's really yeah. No, that thing. makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. That there's a different, technically a different content to the positive judgment than to the negative one. And yeah, it's not, yeah, they're not directly. Yeah, exactly. They don't cancel each other out as, as you put it. Um, uh, just to, to th go back there one more round before we move on, though, um, uh, what, what, I'm, what I was really after is what's going on in uh, 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 when we ascend the mountain uh, and wh wh when we ascend the mountain, even making all the negative and positive judgments uh, and, and or, or as you put it, evil can evil when he's sort of up when he sort of sort of ascended into the air and the the, the he, he's in the circle as it were sort of you know where we might say Aquinas is uh, or, or was um, we, we sometimes use language like seeing the face of God that kind of thing and what where, where I always want to what I always want to ask is uh even here, though, it's a creature that exists in a creaturely mode of existence, because even when evil can evil is in the air floating, evil can evil is not God. <laughs> and Thomas Aquinas is not God. And so his mode of being is uh, his mode of being is uh, 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 still creaturely. Uh, his mode of act, as it were, is still creaturely. And so his whatever he experiences of God is still experienced of God, it, it would seem to me in a creaturely mode. And so 
is there a way of talking about, is, is there an analogy to the to sort of sort of temple ascension there that is the idea between sort of metaphysical ascent and temple ascent that uh, the holy of holies, as it were, is the is something like the closest a creature can get to uh, being possessed of or to staring at pure act or something like that. Is that roughly uh, 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 what's going on? In other words, the gradations up the mountain are removals of potency. They're removals of, you know, you know, embodiment, but then that sort of thing. Yeah, what, what you're saying is not false. Um, there, yeah, your, your, your creatureliness is not uh, abnegated. However, that's not really exactly what the tradition is talking about. Uh, and I think that maybe maybe there's a point of confusion here. We're talking about not not uh, not the knower in himself, but but that by which he knows. Scholastics will talk about the, the the formal species of knowledge, which is basically the source for which this creature uh, extracts information. Again, I'm speaking very very roughly. Um, so like even in heaven our beatific vision, like our creatureliness, that, that problem you're highlighting, it's not a problem, I, and, and you're not saying it is, of course, but that, that feature, as it were, of like, oh, there's still a finite knower in the mix, doesn't go away, <laughs> right? So- Right, in the beatific it, vision, right. In, in the beatific vision. So it's not, it's not really that which the, the tradition is focused upon, it's more the fact that where we're taking our knowledge of God is not uh, immediately God himself. Rather, it's immediately via creatures who image God. And so maybe another way of uh, explaining this by an analogy or uh, an illustration, it's like no matter how far up the mountain you go, and even when you're floating out into space and you have this little cloud, it's totally uh, levitation, um, you're still uh, looking down the mountain at creatures. Mm. You've not yet turned around your head and, and seen the light behind you. So you're like, you're like floating off like this. And uh, everything that's pushed you towards that point, and even the very thing that pushes you to release and jump up, as it were, is from the creaturely side. And uh, ultimately, it is God himself, but it's God himself underneath creatures, uh, already participated by creatures, so to speak. And the, re the reason for that is, is because, you know, whenever we make any true judgments, uh, whether positive or, or, or negative, um, God ultimately is, is, is that why our intellect is made to be true, because he's most pure act and true and being itself are convertible and therefore that the more something is an act, the more it makes the intellect to be true. But that's it, it, the reason why I, meant, I mentioned this is because when I say creatures themselves are forcing you to make this move, this launch up to God, they're like the proximate mm. punch in the face. Well, the force for that punch in the face and all the other forces that can punch you in the face to make that jolt as it were, is ultimately the force of God himself, who's currently behind you. Right. So I don't know if any of that was really helpful. No, that mostly, does help. That helps. It was, that it was mostly just metaphor, but that's basically what's going on. Yeah. Right. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Pilgrim Faith Podcast. The Pilgrim Faith Podcast is a podcast of the Davenant Institute. Our previous episodes can be found by going to youtube.com slash Davenant Institute. The project that Joe and I are interested in is using human wonder to fuel the quest for Christian wisdom. We have interviews with authors and have conversations about topics that interest us. If you find that this content is intriguing and sometimes challenging, but nevertheless edifying, and you'd like to support the project financially, then in the comments section of the YouTube episodes, there's a link that you can access and give any amount to help Joe and I continue to produce content like this. We hope that you will enjoy the rest of this podcast and we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Right.
Right. Um, all right. Well, last time, you know, we talked mostly about simple and, and, and mixed perfections. Uh, and uh, where does where does the tradition sort of go from there once the mind has clear to some extent? Uh, 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 or, or, or let me let me take that back. It wasn't simple mixed perfections. It's names. Once the once the mind has clear sort of the relationship between positive and negative names and how to play them together in the doing of theology, where does new knowledge get gained after that? What do you, what do we begin to do with that fixed set of habits? Yeah. So. Uh... We talked a little bit about last time the fact that as theology develops as a science and a technical discipline, and this takes hundreds and hundreds of years to do, of course, but as it happens, gradually categories uh, arise in the mind, and these are proper concept or rationes, which are the reduction of the creaturely order in as much as it is such, and the production of the mind to be uh, informed by these things at the, at the level of categories. So just use the illustration last time, just as Aristotle develops the 10 categories that adequately divide up ens creatum, just so theology begins to be able to develop adequate divisions of uh, divine names. And we talked a little bit about the fact that divide between negative and positive names and negative names are adequately distinguished into two. We can talk about prior and posterior names and things like incorporeality and impassibility are gonna be prior negative names and simplicity, infinity and others of that sort are gonna be posterior negative names and the different ways that they begin to function and move in theology. And similarly, we have the positive side of theology. We have the simple and mixed perfections or rather the names designated from simple and mixed perfections as we mentioned. What theology is able to do at that point is when you have the production of these categories, then you have the development of real theologians at the level of habits. And I, I, I can't remember how much we talked about this last time, but the, the production of habits is where you have so many times repeated an activity at this junction that it becomes like a living organism alive in the mind and dynamically charged as soon as you need to access it, it's already halfway there, halfway made, as it were. Right. Uh, habits are basically imperfect acts or acts to the mode of actus imperfecti. Um, they're basically little, little, little itty bitty operations uh, that are pre-made and ready to immediately arise into full, a full act of knowledge. So to speak. Yeah, that's what I meant earlier by the invocation of the metaphor of muscle is that it's like, a, it's easier, it's easier to lift yeah. something when you've done yeah. it a billion times. Yeah, you're, you're, it's like you're, not only is it easier to lift, but your, your, your muscles are not just attuned, but they're kind of like, you know, if you've ever been lifting crazy, and then, and then you, and then your arm just doesn't want to go down because it's all the way, you know, it's, yes. all, it's halfway up that that's a habit, right? Yeah. That's, that's the equivalent of, a ha of an intellectual habit. So what happens, this becomes very, very important. Theologians are then able to perform reflective exercise at these junctions. And just like we're able to perform very, very close reflective exercises at these specific categories we mentioned and talk about them and name them and then talk about them to other theologians and, and clarify and produce them and actually produce these categories to start with, just so we're able to perform reflective exercises on the movements we make with each category. So here's a thing, it's a category of divine names, and I perform an associated series of intellectual movements that's repeated and developed and ongoing, and it becomes itself another type of category, which we would call something like second intention, I like to talk about these as theological movements because they're not anything that we say God to be, but rather they are descriptions of, 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 of uh, mental motions that you, know, you always walk five miles in this path in this little circuitous journey anytime you hit anything in this category. So theology is able to develop second intentions, especially in the high medieval time period, starting with someone like Thomas Aquinas, and then 
even after Thomas Aquinas, it, it takes a very long time for these to develop. And by the time you get to the neoscholastics, you have names that are agreed upon by the body of theologians for these second intention habits. So things like formally, eminently, analogically, maximally. Formally is going to be where something as a whole, according to its whole proper concept, in no way is denied of God according to its proper concept, but the whole entirety is affirmed. There's other negative judgments you have to make, but you're not mm -hmm. going to be making any negative judgment to the conceptual content associated right. with it. This is where we, we say that the simple perfections are in God formally. So I don't deny anything of the essence of what love is of God. Right. Rather, I pop and drop all of the essence of love into God. And I say it's formally and things like that. Yeah. Eminently is going to be, no, there's going to be some aspect of the essence of this perfection because it's not pure perfection, but it's also mixed in with potency or some aspect of imperfection. It's going to be some aspect of this essence, some, some ratio of this essence, which I'm going to have to deny of God. Even though I can affirm this whole thing of God, I'm going to have to chop a little portion of it off. And there's going to be various aspects or levels of, of what I chop off. And some names are going to have to have more of their cells chopped off because they're less perfect names and things like that. But nonetheless, we say they're all em eminently in God. Analogically is a very tricky one, of course. It means not univocally and not equivocally, broadly speaking. It's a, com it's a compound of two negatives, not in every way univocally and not in every way equivocally. Hmm. That's what it means to be analogically. The, the, in the intellect verges all the way down. Thomas does this repeatedly in his works, and most people don't pick up on it. Unfortunately, it's very, very, been, been very, very detrimental to the history of reflection on what analogical metaphysics is, what analogical theology is, and things like that. You know, we recognize that in no way is anything univocally said of God and creatures. Or really, we ought to say nothing is in every, in, nothing is in any way said of creatures and God univocally, and nothing is in every way said of creatures and God equivocally. And that's what it means to perform analogy in a very, mm. very complex way. These second intentions become incredibly important. And this is relevant to, I think, what we'll be transitioning to when we start talking about the doctrine of the Trinity. These second intention habits become absolutely essential for when it comes to dealing with the positive data of supernatural revelation in Holy Scripture as we take up from the books that God has given us the right judgments that we ought to make and recognize that the words on the page are stuffed with various judgments and objects which are to be affirmed and negated, not just absolutely speaking, but even in certain respects affirmed in certain respects denied. And when you start doing the doctrine of the Trinity, if you're not possessed of these habits mind, you're not going to be able to do the doctrine of the Trinity. You're not going to be able to assimilate various kinds of analogy. Some analogies have some aspect of imperfection mixed in with themselves. Guess what they're going to be? They're going to be eminently in the Trinity. Hmm. Some analogies have no aspect of imperfection, like the psychological analogy, and therefore they're going to be formally in the Trinity. Does that mean that God is this very analogy that I've said him to be? No, this is where I run analogically, things like this. It becomes very, very important to understand this because Holy Scripture, when it speaks of the doctrine of the Trinity, as God condescends to graciously reveal us to himself, uh, himself to us, uh, he uses many, many modes of doing so, much of which is metaphorical, much of which is, mm. is talking to little baby children much of which is using the analogy of the egg, much of which he is not at all, except for like any little, even little bit of you know, light that he can squish into your brain. And he's so gracious and kind that he's willing to take this on and he can take this on. But you have to understand that when you take on this positive moment of understanding of what the Trinity is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's a massive miles of negations standing on top of that large amount of dissimilitude 
that you have to be able to enact as a theologian. So once again, just like we talked about the mountain, when we move to the doctrine of the Trinity, we have real theologians who are able to do and teach doctrine of God. We talked about participation last time and the fact that most lay people have to and ought to, and this is uh, God's gift to them to be able to participate in the knowledge of others, just like it's God's gift to teachers to have others participate in their knowledge. Like it's, it's a humbling thing for both parties. No, 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 nobody's better than anything else. But most lay people are going to need to participate in the negative movement that's only present in the theologian when he squishes in them out of the analogy of an egg, the doctrine of the Trinity or whatsoever analogy you want to talk about. But guess what? The theologian has to be consciously performing this mile of negations, climbing up to God, standing in the cloud of unknowing so that the entire earth is raised up to God and participates in this movement and journey of mind into God. And if you don't have that, then you're not going to be uh, in good shape and you're going to be positing innumerable errors mixed in with the true things you're saying. Of course, yeah. it's very bad. And you're not going to be able to read Holy Scripture. You're not going to be able to obtain the sense of Holy Scripture, the sense being yeah. the rationes or the proper intellectual movement along with all the associated objects, creaturely objects, which are affirmed, denied, affirmed, denied, affirmed, denied, stuffed into this little itty bitty word of dead text that has to be sprung out into a living intellect because that's where it was originally in the mind of a human and God participating, etc. cetera, um, of which this word is only a mere sign. You have to, again, allow it to enact in you all, all that movement of thought. And if, mm. you, if you don't have possessed of yourself all of these habits of mind, you're going to deeply, deeply struggle and not be able to read Holy Scripture. According to sense, you're going to be performing imaginations. This is very important to understand. Dionysius and Thomas talk about all the time, people who are not powerful enough to transcend the imagination. This is a phrase that Thomas uses innumerable times throughout his works non valentes transcendere they're not strong enough to transcend phantasm and therefore they're always thinking of god materially with their brain they're imagining things they're seeing things it's like they're having double even vision. when they're doing the doctrine of divine simplicity <laughs> even when oh please don't start with that but yeah <laughs> they're stuck in their senses and then you hear like the fathers who are raving about these people who are sensual and sexual and impassioned and wh why are they saying these types of things is because they're in the body and they're not able they're not strong enough it's a phrase that thomas uses because he literally means they're not strong enough and it's not a condemnation it's a statement of fact a statement of compassion a statement that recognizes that when we are weak then god is strong a statement that rests upon divine grace and all of these other many, many things, but does acknowledge the fact that many, if not most people are not strong enough to transcend phantasm and, and begin to actually do real theological work. And so they read the words sensually, sexually, passionately, and their mind is for, forges God after the image of creatures, these types of issues. And uh, man, when you get to the doctrine of the Trinity, of which there is no creaturely analog, mm. that's where it gets really, really hard. Because when people are imagining in their mind, they're still having hold of something that is similar to God. And so in a certain sense, they have not fully gone off the wrong track, so to speak. When you get to the doctrine of the Trinity, there's no... There's no material reality out there that's similar to the Trinity sufficiently to prevent imagination when it's imagined to entirely uh, be false, might as well entirely be false. And uh, you know, people, people are struggle with that. So you have to develop these habits in order to then move over here, in order to access the true sense of Holy Scripture, which is not made up, but uh, is nonetheless accessed only by way of negative judgment, these types of things. Yeah. One of the things you're saying that I, I find very fascinating, and maybe this is worth, because um, I think uh, 
next week we'll we'll especially perhaps get into the to the doctrine of the trinity and and ask some questions about that but we're, we're beginning to talk about it now uh and one of the things that you you've said that parody is a thing you've said about divine simplicity in the in the previous discussion uh we were talking in the previous discussion about how what we don't want to do with divine simplicity is sort of negate all these things of god and then you finally negate a certain sort of composition you know essence essence and existence is the final i you know at least one of the final negations <laughs> i don't want to pretend i know uh but what you don't want to do is sort of project outside of that and then imagine this sort of unity uh, and then draw your theology on the image of kind of this dense ball of unity or something even though the mind somewhat naturally wants to do that you have to you have to sort of you have to sort of help it not develop the habit of doing that similarly in the trinity one of the things you've said that that's interesting is that on, on the one hand there's a way in which the trinity uh i, I don't want to say works the same way because we don't arrive at the trinity philosophically in the same sense but that the trinity is done but but, but, <laughs> the, but the <laughs> right <laughs> but the trinity is done from the same position and so like in other words what what one could get the imagining of is that because the trinity as a reality is something that is in god or whatever uh, and, and and god is revealing himself to us as three persons one could imagine that oh i have now it's not divine simplicity, but the Trinity. <laughs> now I have gotten a kind of handle inside of God that I can go stand in and look back upon creatures with. Yeah. And what you're sort of saying is even at both simplicity and the Trinity in a way, part of what unites, it seems to me, both of the things you want to say about these disputes is you have to always remember where you're doing any of it from, which is right here. And where you're doing Trinity from is never in a way that, because the simplicity movement, the 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 the, uh, the 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 boomerang into the cloud of unknowing and those all the negative and judgment that's, that that implies, yeah. is already implied, already assumed when you start to do Trinity, and so you don't expect when you start talking about the Trinity to to <clears throat> arrive at. I hate to put it this way, but the sort of ultimate philosophical talking point that's going to click all of metaphysics together for you. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah ma ma making, making, the, making the Trinity a magic answer to one of many problem or magic answer to becoming and being. And those types of things. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. And this is something that uh, just as we say God is not or God does not exist, just so we have to say that God is not the Trinity that you know him to be. And you need to really sit with that and all of its scariness and understand how radical of a statement and how radical of a programmatic principle that statement actually is. Mm. And you just need to come to grips with that and become possessed of that and conscious of that in all of your work. Um, Everyone thinks that God is the Trinity they think him to be. God is just not that Trinity that you think him to be, that you know him to be, that you say him to be. You know, the kind of common uh, dicta, I feel like it's, uh, I feel like it's from Augustine. I'm going to butcher it because I'm quoting from memory. Something like God is more, more knowable than you say him to be and is more than you know him to be. So it's, it's, you can say less then you know, and you know less than he is. Hmm. And that's a comment, I, if I recall, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that's a comment with respect to the essence and attributes of God, which of course is, is true, but it's also true with respect to the doctrine of the Trinity as well. In the uh, wake of the 20th century uh, ravings about the doctrine of the Trinity that we find especially popularized by guys like Karl Barth, Karl Rahner, and many others of that sort, you uh, have the popular notion on the street, in the pew, and especially in the academy, and, 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 and very, very popular in the League of Theologians, which is an incredibly wrong notion, and it's popularized and centralized around Rahner's rule, this idea that the imminent trinity is the economic trinity and vice versa. Well, this is just not what the tradition says in its entire, it is false to say, it can be true to say, but it's false to say, and it certainly gives a false impression. 
God is not that Trinity that you that you say him to be. It's 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 precisely the opposite. The economic Trinity is similar to the imminent Trinity, but the imminent Trinity is not similar to the economic. Right. It's very, very important. There's an ever greater dissimilitude running through the center of the similarity, the economic Trinity. And 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 so there we're we're stretching, we're 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 um, <clears throat> expanding even a little bit more uh, closely and carefully when we say God is not the Trinity you know him to be. And we, we explain that as uh, in terms of the economic Trinity indeed being similar to the imminent Trinity, but not vice versa. In no way there's an ever greater dissimilitude punching the center out of the similarity of the economic Trinity where you know, the, you know uh, God, God is Trinity. Um, you don't understand that and you don't act out of that place of theology then you're never going to be right and uh and, and you're going to be a whole lot wrong as well and it's that's deeply prob problematic and i i have to say so it's very scary for most people most people don't like to hear that and and, and that's perfectly fine it's, it's no problem but uh it's also helpful because most of the issues that people come up against like these little things that they have great anxiety about it's like all oh, these paradoxes all oh, these contradictions oh this not like almost always i've watched this for many years almost always whenever anyone is is bothered by a genuine intuition they know they have which is true mm -hmm. and then like the seeming weirdness that follows from it almost always they're forgetting the fact that there's a dissimilitude and so at first it might seem like Oh, 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 much more scary, much more radical. God is much more, much less understandable than I ever thought him to be, which is true. But it's actually much more settling, much more comforting, and removes all of the logical and rational yeah. problems that uh, are generated by, by not accounting for the, the degree of dissimilitude or any dissimilitude at all. Yeah. You, you, you have to recognize that, that, so concentrating on the similitude and dissimilitude is, is another way of occupying the space. It's, it's, it's occupying it more fully, mm. but it's another way of occupying the space that's articulated by the tradition. When we say that the mysteries of faith, for instance, the doctrine of the Trinity is not going to be against reason, but it's going to be uh, beyond reason. Right. This, this kind of center space uh, where you recognize in no way are you ever going to have a logical contradiction. No way are you going to come up with paradox. No way are you going to come up with something that is true of faith and not true in natural theology. There are innumerable negative judgments that you have to make when you talk about the relationship between the natural order and the supernatural order, where we have the respective revelations, the natural theology uh, that, that accrue into natural theology and supernatural theology. But nonetheless, uh, none of them are going to be any, any wise contrary properly speaking, in a very, very technical sense of contrary. And when you begin to uh, recognize that, you come out the other side of this great anxiety of re recognizing you know, God is not the Trinity you know him to be. And it's like, yeah, that's true, but now I don't have any of all these logical quandaries and problems I was having before. And this is actually total, totally okay and rational to believe. Uh, it requires belief, yeah. but it's perfectly rational to believe. Yeah, when you said that, I actually, that was my reaction to what you were saying is, it, first of all, it strikes me that that's just, uh, that's that's one of those things that sounds scary, but it's almost impossible that that is not true. Uh, yeah, be, 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 for what you said earlier, it's like, what you said earlier is exactly right. We have to remember that most of us, and I could probably include myself in this, most of us do not possess the mental strength to move fully beyond some attachment to the phantasm. Uh, uh, and that's, you know, that's how God made us. That's not even necessarily a problem as such, 100%. but, but, but you recognize that the mind possessed of a certain strength can move further than that. Uh, and, and, and what, what you're also saying, I think Ryan is like, it, that statement is also true for the theologian after a respect what they think when they say Trinity, the, hot, the, the, the most precise way to say Trinity, the, the actual what of the Trinity, uh, 
the actual dense reality that is whatever we name when we say Trinity also transcends that. And it seems to me that's just a statement of that, that's pretty it's vanilla just, in it one just sense. God's bigger. Yeah. We think him to be, you know, we can, and, and that we is can comforting. go total veg, we can go total veggie tales on this. <laughs> <laughs> God is bigger and that's yes. what it means. And, yes. and yeah, we ought to be perfectly fine with uh, admitting that uh, we're smaller than God and our, and our thoughts are smaller than God. There's no problem. Uh, one, one quick clarification. Um, formal, you, you, you formal eminent and analogical uh, uh, is I would understand it and help correct my understanding. Uh, both formal and eminent would would be analogical is a bigger category. Does it include formal? In other words, we say formal attribute of love, and yet we only understand love on the analogy of creatures. And so, yada yada. Do those overlap in some way? Say the formal attribute of love is it also analogical? I mean, it or or is that car, or is that tradition carving that up a little bit differently than I'm deploying it? Yeah, I don't want to answer your question. So it's a, it's, a very, it's a very good question, but I'm not going to answer your question because it's very it's very technical. It basically has to do all the all these uh, all these uh, formalities, which they're not forms, of course, they're formalities, uh, inform various movements of mind, various sections of the movement of mind that, that we make when we when we talk about God. And uh, it, the, the precise movement of mind is, is technically speaking the movement of verification for, for which the, the intellect undergoes in order to posit something in re. Uh, when, we, when we say a ratio is in re, uh, an, a, a, a mental moment, as it were, is in reality, or the mind is standing with the facts, the mind is uh, clicking with the real or having, having a reality outside of it, echo, mm -hmm. echo back to the mind's judgment and say, Hey, what you're thinking is a uh, good job. You know, when, when the intellect posits something in God, posits its ratio in God, which is, it doesn't do, but when the intellect thinks it posits something in God, because we can't reach up to God, right? So, but nonetheless, when the intellect posits something in Ray and we say something's in God. When it puts it um, in, the, uh, in the train cart that's supposed to go up to God. <laughs> when the intellect puts something in itself, which it says is in God. Yes. Yeah. Um, the intellect must undergo a very long journey where it places its hands on many different things in order to become pressed and attuned to reality as such as the movement of verification. And at various moments, there's purgation that happens depending on what type of thing, what type of predicate is being affirmed. And so broadly speaking, formally and eminently, when I say love is in God, the mind reflects back down to creaturely love and apprehends the fact that love as such is pure similitude to God. And therefore, there's no aspect of negation. There's no aspect of dissimilitude in this real creaturely love, which I'm affirming mm. to God, because creatures are the proximate verification for all the intellectual judgments we can make. And therefore, I'm not purging this, and then I'm sweeping back up to God. And I'm trying to register that space of participation, as it were, between this participated version of love and the exemplar love in God, as it were. And so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to reiterate that space in my own. When I look at something like human reasoning and I say God reasons, uh, then I go down into my little phantasm and I access the proper concept of phantasm because I've encountered this in reality. And therefore I match my mind up to the idea I had in my brain. And I go down, technically wouldn't do this with reasoning, but nonetheless, uh, we go down and we realize that there's an aspect of similarity and dissimilarity in this creature mm, reality, which is practically verifying my mind. And I go snap, and then I'm able to posit my ratio and ray. I'm able to snap my mind into reality by virtue of recognizing or feeling or touching or becoming conformed to this dissimilarity. Analogically, is is a is a is a a, a much more complex moment after after those types of moments. Right. Uh, that, that, that is running, technically speaking, when we are, when we are, uh, when we are making formally to be in the intellect and things like that. Um, but nonetheless, yeah, it's, 
if you if you if you think about it in terms of um, a, a proposition for a moment, you have the subject and you have the predicate. Formally is talking about the relationship between the predicate with respect to the subject. And if the whole thing of the predicate is in the subject, which the mind has made in, a, in, a, in, a, in the unity of judgment, it's it's composed or perhaps it's divided for making a negative judgment. When the whole thing is in there, is in there, then we say it's formally, just like a form is in a thing. That's where that's so formally is expropriated from how forms are in things. Right. Eminently is when, oh no, only part of it is in the subject, part of it is not. Right. Something along those lines. Yeah. So there's lots of different analogies that you can use and you ought to use that are creature land because technically speaking, and this is where things get very, very spicy. When we talk about formally and eminently, God is always more eminently than any creature is eminently of another creature. Mm. For very complex reasons. <laughs> this becomes extremely important in theology because, for instance, so where we say maximally, so usually where the tradition talks about maximum. When I say God is merciful because he makes an effect to be such that he is said to be merciful when he relieves us of a burden or you know, something we're sad about. And when I say, you know, Joe is merciful because he's gone out and he's helped his brother and he's made an effect to be such that now my mind is true in predicating mercy of you your relationship to that effect that you just brought to be is not the same as God's relationship to the effect which he's just brought to be. Mm. In fact, there's an ever greater difference between your relationship to the effect of mercy such that you're said to be merciful and God's relationship to the effect such that he's said to be merciful. And in fact, that ever greater difference is so much so that God is infinitely more merciful in you just by virtue of positing that effect than you and I could ever be. And in fact, this is where we begin to register a whole line of negative judgments. God is even more merciful because he's not brought to do that. You and I have to run through a series of change. You and I have to react. You and I have to respond. You and I have to move through potency and to act, whereas God is not that way. Mm. So there you hear both are eminently in Joe and in God but one is more eminently in God than in Joe. For what you're saying, interestingly, sounds to me a lot like what I see in just kind of the general monotheist tradition. I know a little bit of, I know some Sufi writing, and I think even the Quran has this verse, uh, God is closer to you than your own jugular vein. And it seems to me the more I look at kind of post-Neoplatonist development of just monotheist thought in general, this language of God's, uh, 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 the profundity of his presence in the created order, uh, the, 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 the closeness almost is, is, is almost the, the metaphor I want to use of God to, to everything in the created order sounds analogous to what you're saying there, which is just something I, I think I see in just kind of all high monotheist philosophical traditions yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah maybe um as a transition to uh, toward the end here as we're as we're winding down um i think it would be i'm asking this out of some you know with having such limited knowledge of the tradition in some ways you were talking earlier about this moment of you know you sort of get on the you get on the 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 Mount of Sinai, you float up, you're looking down back at creatures. And yet, of course, there's this great metaphor in the in the in the Bible and in the whole Christian tradition that ultimately we see the face of God. Uh, what metaphysically, if somebody were to try and describe what it means for a creature in the tradition to see the face of God, it seems as though there's this moment of and may, maybe these the metaphors just get mixed here. Maybe in the way you described it, nobody ever turns around and sees the face of God in that sense. But is there a way in which that metaphor mixes with the kind of biblical tradition of seeing the face of God and that there is something where the creature 
sees the face of God. And I guess the question I'm asking there is, is how does, what does that boundary mean metaphysically? Does, does that always imply God's giving us his face nevertheless in a, in a mode uh, uh, fitting to creatures because we are creatures yeah. or is there a category that's being missed when you when you generate a conundrum like that um well i'm not sure exactly how the metaphor is being used but i imagine it could be used in two ways one would be as a metaphor for the beatific vision which is usually how it's used we, we no longer see in a veil but now we see face to face it's basically a difference between the way of doing theology in this life where we take our knowledge from creatures and the way of doing theology in the next life where we take our knowledge from God. So that would be one way, but uh, maybe we could use it another way and say that we do see the face of God as in the mirror creatures, which is not what Paul is talking about. And, and I'm not exactly sure, uh, Joe, uh, where, what part of the tradition you're, you're taking this metaphor from, but uh, it would seem to me that it's primarily localized insofar as I've heard of it uh, in, mm. in, in the former category, and not so much what the, the type of metaphor that we would use very frequently, at least as far as we're conventionally agreed upon, uh, not mixing metaphors, uh, with respect to how we perceive God really in, 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 in the mirror, analogically speaking. Because we usually talk about seeing God's backside, right? This is where Moses sees the back of God. We don't see the face, we see the backside of God. Um, that's, that's, that seeing in the veil, seeing in the mirror, seeing darkly, these types of things. So, mm. okay, okay, that's helpful. Um, all right, uh, any other thoughts or anything you think sh that we should have our minds arrived at before we go into next week and maybe take up the Trinity more specifically? Um, well, maybe we can just mention kind of uh, where some of this uh, starts to cash out, as it were, is when you. Uh, I think I mentioned this a little bit, when you begin to recognize the different ways of acting with the different analogies that we might use uh, when we're speaking about the doctrine of the Trinity, many of which are biblical analogies. Uh, much of the Bible is, uh, is, uh, is, is metaphor in the technical sense of metaphor, not, not just analogical in the technical sense of the fact that there's always an ever greater similitude running, running therein. Um, much of the Holy Scriptures are speaking metaphorically or improperly in the technical sense of improperly. Um, when it comes to God, and that's for innumerable reasons, and also when it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity. Lots of times today, many Trinitarian controversies arise when somebody picks up a metaphor for the doctrine of the Trinity, which is used as an analogy, and either doesn't have enough negations or isn't handling it very well, or has promoted it to being uh, uh, a type of analogy which, is, which does not contain any aspects of imperfection. So to give a concrete case, for instance, like the ESS, ERAS, eternal subordination stuff, basically says, look, there are other relations that we can talk about that would help us understand the relationship between father and son in God himself, for instance, the relationship of, uh, you know, submission and authority, authority and submission, vice versa. Right. Uh, this, this, this is a helpful metaphor. And, and yes, it is. Uh, one could say this, but this is in the relationship of father and son, eminently speaking, not formally speaking, because there's some aspect of imperfection, which is not proper to God. So something has to be struck out of the essence of this analogy. Whereas if you go over to the psychological analogy, relations of paternity and filiation, technically speaking, are also metaphors. But that's another story. When you get into the relations of uh, origin of a word from a speaker, which is where the psychological analogy, then all of a sudden you don't have any aspect of imperfection. And therefore, it's formally in God. And always, 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 always in theology, we go the highest we can go. We do the best we can possibly do. And we don't, uh, we don't construct doctrine of God out of metaphor. Rather, we construct doctrine of God with things that we, we said formally of God. And then we use metaphor to help people get into this. Maybe mm -hmm. they need to rest there for a little while. or Maybe they're children. And I mean that, uh, I mean, I mean, actual children. Like when I'm speaking to children, yeah. uh, like, I mean, what am I actually saying? 
I'm, 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 I'm thrusting them up very, very carefully into the right position where 10 years down the road, they'll be able to get there. Like, what is that? Yeah. In no way How many is gods easy. are there? How many persons is God yeah. good enough? No, yeah. yeah. Down to three. In no way is this to be despised. This is yeah. what God himself does with us as children. And we are all to come to God as little children. Um, but you just have to recognize that there are aspects of imperfection that attend the metaphor, or maybe there's no aspect of imperfection. Notice I switched on you and I did not say there's some aspect of perfection. Mm -hmm. We can't say that because then we would be able to demonstrate the Trinity philosophically, which we cannot do mm -hmm. because we cannot do it. Therefore, it's just the fact of not having any aspect of imperfection rather than actually having some aspect of perfection, which attends the analogy. And if you don't recognize that, uh, well, you're going to end up in bad places, but it's very important. So even when we expropriate formally, over here from natural theology, where we talk about the essence attributes of God, and then we just so in supernatural theology, and we say, aha, psychological analogy is formally in God. These relations of origin are formally in God. That just means that there's no aspect to this, which is not in God. It does not mean it is in God. Mm. Mm. Again, here the default language, having removed everything creatures, Therefore, what remains is God. It's a similar type of event happening uh, that we rest upon by virtue of supernatural revelation, which God is, uh, where, where, where God has told us uh, what, what he is and, uh, and has uh, condescended to us. So, so the, so movement, the movement of Trinitarian theology then would be to take the, the scriptural handles and the metaphors and the statements and to, uh, to figure out when they're when they're categorized as it were what the most formal thing that is left over and then yeah. to reflect upon the trinity by staring at the most formal statement and that's going to wind up that's going to wind up being something like uh and we'll get into this next week but that's going to wind up getting us into i guess personal names or something like that or not it's the personal names yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah. there's five okay. there's five there's five mental moments that you can get to which are also just as categories for the doctrine of the trinity Paternity, filiation, active spiration, passive spiration. And then this little guy over here called anascibility, which is incredibly difficult to produce and yield in the mind. It's something that people need to pick up on. Thomas Aquinas talks, talks in this type of language. Mm. Anascibility is yielded in the mind, in the creaturely mind. It's produced in the mind. Hmm. That's interesting. If you don't know how to produce it, and if you cannot produce it, you better not talk about inaccessibility. And it's certainly not the place for constituting the, the father himself. That's why we put it all the way at the end. Uh, in fact, we put it all the way at the end because this is a massive, massive, it's like 50 miles of negative judgments squished in here. Mm. <laughs> And then you recognize, oh, this is on the opposite end and how it pertains to paternity and things like that. But yeah, there's five adequate categories that divide up the doctrine of the Trinity. So when I sit and I teach the doctrine of the Trinity, I have consciously in my mind the fact that I need to get across to people five mental moments or at least four, and leave off an ability. And they need to understand these are basically the four real relations that are in God. Notions are not, uh, I have to be careful how I say, but notions are not that which is in God, but rather that which is in us, which corresponds to that which is in God. So there's right. even uh, <laughs> plenty of space where we have to make many negative judgments between those two things. But nonetheless, we can, we can, we can uh, make them sloppy. These are basically the four real relations in God, paternity, filiation, active and passive aspiration. And I just need to teach you and invest you with the proper intellectual habits for saying these in God and then construct your mind to circulate and surge along this and then become verified of what God is and reflect and therefore have your love specified by these ideas that you have now become possessed of in order for us to return to God. And again, that's really the work of the theologian. Right. Well, that's, that's beautiful. And so next week we'll pick up and talk about the Trinity. And I think under those, yeah, under those species you just discussed and 
we'll give a uh, we'll give uh, uh, the world a, a crash course in inassibility, I guess. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, thank you very much, Ryan. It was good to have you again today. Uh, once again, you can find us on social media apps, Facebook, and such. Dale normally does the end, and he does it so much better than I do. Uh, but uh, f find us there uh, for now. That's it for today. Uh, we'll see you next week. And uh, thanks again, Ryan. Thank you. Yeah.